Hello everybody, I want to thank you all so much for coming to my lecture recital and coming to support me and my work and my research. Um, but more importantly, coming to support the music of underrepresented cultures and underrepresented, um, uh, from underrepresented people, composers. Uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of music and a lot of culture and art that goes largely overlooked in the repertoire and the whole grand scheme of things in the whole world. It's great that we study the music of Mozart and Beethoven and Schubert and Rachmaninoff, but there's a lot of beautiful and really enriching art um, throughout the entire world that um, until recently hasn't been uh, quite studied into and put a spotlight on. And I'm really happy to be a part of this like sort of global movement around the world that's doing this and putting a spotlight on the music of underrepresented cultures. So this all started from a, a grant from the Office of Undergrad Research. Um, oh, come on in, come on. I'm gonna leave the door open just so some people can come trickle in. No, that's okay. Um, so this all started, I got awarded a grant from the Office of Undergrad Research to conduct, conduct some undergrad research over the summer, and then also get some money to be able to go travel to Chicago uh, with my piano studio with Dr. McVeigh. And uh, a huge thank you to Dr. Miranda Wilson and Dr. McVeigh for writing my grants. I would not be here without them and have this wonderful opportunity to uh, put a spotlight on Manuel Ponce and his piano works and the music of Mexico and how it evolves and whatnot. Um, Again, this really matters, and I really just want to acknowledge all of you guys for coming out of your way, not just to support me, but to educate yourselves on underrepresented cultures and their beautiful, enriching music. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a uh, brief history of the music of Mexico and how that evolved throughout the times. By the time the Spanish uh, conquistadors and Hernan Cortes arrived in Mexico in 1519, they had already found a uh, rich and real developed nation of the Aztecs. It wasn't like they just got there and you know there were these indigenous people that weren't quite already developed. They already had cities and there were um, there was society, there was culture, there was religion, and a lot of the music that they found served sacred purposes. So it was music and dances that were coinciding to conduct rituals and all different types of worship uh, purposes. By the time they got there, they found different types of instruments, such as all different sizes of drums. Some pictures here that I think are really cool. They found different ocarinas that were made of clay. They found reed flutes. They found uh, bone and wooden rasps and rattling vessels, like different types of shakers and maracas that they had made. However, no notation was ever found, so we don't have any surviving Aztec melodies. So we don't really know what this type of music would have actually sounded like in context. The closest thing that we do have is the music of isolated tribes in Mexico that have somewhat survived over the times, but we don't, we will never really know what that music actually sounded like. It's believed that the percussion um, served an accompaniment role and a sort of ostinato role throughout the music, and then the clay and reed flutes and the conch shell trumpets served to kind of play melodies over the accompaniment. Um, but it uh, was very cooperative with dance and ritual. So when the conquistadors and Hernan Cortes and his men came to conquer Mexico in 1519, um, I mentioned that they found no notation, but I think it's also important to mention that it's very possible that they maybe found notation and destroyed it. And it's very possible that they came because of their purpose to conquer and control the Americas and Mexico and gather resources and land. Uh, they, they tried to find any way to control the Aztecs and the, any indigenous people that they found there and their culture. And by doing so, I think it's very possible that they could have found notation and it was just never recorded or never put down or simply just destroyed. Uh, they used a lot of the, um, they used their own folk music and their own uh, sacred music to sort of oppress the indigenous people of Mexico and uh, influence and bring their own influences into the Americas. And so the Catholic Church was one way that they did this. So a lot of the music that was spread out throughout Mexico during this time was sacred music, such as chants and different types of uh, choral group uh, singing music. Uh, they did bring, however, a lot of folk songs from Spain, such as Seguidillas, Boleros, Fandangos, Zapateados, and Jotas. And some of those are names that, of genres that have evolved to what we now would call today, such as a Zapateado, and a Seguidilla, or a Jota, is music that we would call today, but it came from a very rich influence from Spain. They did bring over a lot of instruments as well, and a lot of music education. Hernan Cortes and his men brought over uh, a lot of uh, ways to uh, spread this music by, uh, by education. So they started schools 
there was a man that was named Pedro de Ante that came to Mexico from Spain and started different schools of music, and he brought over different types of instruments, such as guitars, harps, violas, vihuelas, and the lute. All of this music combined with also the music of Africa as well, because when the Spanish came over, they brought over enslaved persons and captured people from Africa that brought over their own culture and their own rhythmic influences that combined to other genres, of course, as well as rumbas, pambas, and mapangos. Come on. Good to see this. Hey, how you doing, this? Um, And all of this music sort of combined to make what we now call mestizo music. Uh, there's a quote by a student of Manuel Ponce that's named Carlos Chavez. He was from very early on, early on an influence, um, or he was rather influenced by Manuel Ponce um, throughout his entire life. And I like to say that he's kind of like his predecessor. Um, he has a quote that describes the Mexico, the music of Mexico as the native music of the ancient Mexicans, the music of the Spanish or other origin implanted in Mexico, and the production in Mexico of a mixture of these elements. I think it's important to sort of uh, acknowledge that it's not just the music of, of Spain and like the instruments of Spain and the melodies of the Aztecs and the rhythms of Africa sort of combining into like one thing, uh, but rather it's all of these influences being in one place over time and how that evolved to become the music that we now know today, such as mariachi music or zapateados or corridos. So while I was conducting my research and I was doing all this reading and I was doing all this practicing and playing the music of Manuel Ponce, my main goal and the title of my research was the folk influences on the piano works of Manuel Maria Ponce. And I was specifically looking for genres that I found to have heavy influence on his piano works. And I found two genres that I think not only have heavy influence on the music of Manuel Ponce, but also kind of define the sound of Mexico as a whole. The first genre that I want to talk about is the son or the wapango. The son is a type of tap dance music folk genre that we would call in Spanish a zapateado. Uh, the word wapango comes from the word for uh, hardwood floor from uh, the ancient Aztec language. Uh, there are different types of regional subgenres of the son, but they all have the same purpose of sort of a collaborative dance and music folk genre where the dance serves a sort of like percussive role, right? Where it's tap dancing and it's not just being danced to the music and the music isn't just being played for the dance. There are two different subgenres of the song uh, that developed in, in different types of, I mean, there are many, but there are two really important ones that I wanna go over today. There's the song Jalisciense that developed in, in Jalisco, Mexico. And if you know anything about the music of Mexico and how it all came to be, uh, it is believed that mariachi music comes from Jalisco, and that comes from the regional subgenre of the song, the song Jalisciense. And we can hear it in the rhythmic, uh, in the way that the melodies are rhythmically placed throughout the music, and how there's diff all the different orchestration and the melody and the singing all kind of form together to create this groove, which is mariachi music. And I think that's how we can tell that it's um, very song influenced. In Northern Huasteca, we have the son huasteco, which has evolved to what we now would call today a zapateado or a wapango. And that one is a bit more based around um, the, the music itself and the dance rather than uh, a combination of that and then like a way of storytelling and lyrics. So I have some examples here of that. Oh, sorry. The sesquiatera. The sesquiatera is, uh, in English we would call this a gemiola. And the sesquiatera is less of a specific set of notes or a specific set of, um, of uh, notes, rhythms, um, and it's rather more of like a flexibility uh, of rhythmic, sorry, <laughs> I like to call it a rhythmic concept of freedom between binary and tertiary based rhythms, and it invokes a heavy dance topic within the music. So whenever we have like, um, you hear a sort of Latin song or a Latin inspired song, it is really likely that they have this type of sesquiatera and it can take on different forms throughout the music. And we like to say that it takes on like a vertical or a horizontal form throughout music. And so it can sound like this. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, where there's this kind of flexibility and groove within the rhythm. And it can also take a vertical form such as this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, where there's this flexibility between it all. And um, this can be shown with like accents within the melody, or inflections in the melody, or simply just like accompaniment within the percussion. 
I have a couple of examples here. This is a more traditional example of what a son or a wabango would be. And this is a rather modern interpretation or modern homage to the genre itself and where it would have come from. This is a bit more orchestrated out. And um, I would also say that this is more akin to the son jalisciense and that of mariachi music. Um, and one thing to really listen to is, is the way that the rhythms all kind of come together and combine to create this groove. has evolved into. This is something that you would hear more akin to something you hear like at a quinceanera or a Mexican wedding and the type of music that they would play there. And this is the type of music they would really dance to and we would call it zapateado today. So that first one you saw there were like violins and there was um, a bajo and like all these different types of traditional instruments that we see in mariachi music. Um, but over time and you know through regional evolution, uh, this music kind of adapted other instruments like the accordion and uh, the uh, saxophone as we saw in that one. But I think it's really interesting you know, that we get a lot of influences from America and all these different instruments from Eastern Europe and whatnot. Um, and that's kind of you know part of the beauty of the music of Mexico that it's it's. It's got a really specific sound to Mexico, but it's also, you can hear all these different influences from um, places you wouldn't even think of, right? So, yeah, uh, from 1910 to 1920, I'll go into a little bit more how it affected Manuel Ponce and his life, but there was a Mexican Revolution, and this is a really big uh, historical mark in Mexico, um, but it was during this time that a lot of stories were to be told in Mexico, and in order to tell these stories, one way that they did that was by telling songs, and since the purpose of, uh, uh, of uh, the music, this music that came out of it during this time, 
was to tell stories and to tell um, um, stories of like generals and battles and runaway soldiers or maybe a, a, the feelings of being at war. The melodies are really catchy and the harmonies are really simple, but this music developed to be what we now call today a corrido. And this music is really popular in Mexico today and even in popular music. And it's taken on different forms, but it's still kept the same purpose of sort of telling a story. Um, it's really common to hear this music either be orchestrated and out with all these different instruments like a harp, um, a guitar, and maybe some, uh, some woodwinds and brass as sort of serving counter melodies and adding harmony to the music. But it's also really common to hear this music as uh, just having a guitar and like there being a singer singing the lyrics. Um, but its main purpose is really to tell a story. Sometimes you would hear the melodies be orchestrated, and I think that this uh, aspect of the music is sort of what gives some of Mexican music its sound. So you might have a melody that sounds like this. And then underneath it, you would have another singer that would want to make the melody more enriching and more beautiful. And a really easy way to do that is to do what we call in music uh, diatonic parallel thirds, where the singer goes down and sings the same shape of the melody, but just with different notes. So if the melody is here, the other person might be singing underneath it. And so if you put that together, it sounds really rich and, and, and beautiful, but also really simple to sing as well. It's a really beautiful way to like make a melody sound more full and um, even make it more fun to sing with your friends and soldiers out at war. Um, so I have some more uh, examples of this, and I think one important thing to listen to in this music, especially the corrido and mariachi music, but more specifically the corrido, and even throughout time, I'll, I have a modern uh, interpretation of this music as well, is at the end of each phrase, there's a falling melisma in the voice that marks the end of a phrase lyrically, but also musically. So if you listen, there are singers in this older, uh, more traditional interpretation of a corrido, uh, where they'll be singing maybe like da 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 where they'll be falling, not a specific interval, sometimes it comes out to in music what we call like a major third or a perfect fourth, um, but it sort of signifies the end of a phrase and that's also a part of um, the music that I think gives it a sort of Mexican sound. This is Valentin de la Sierra. <laughs> especially during the Mexican Revolution and during the early 1900s because um, Mexico uh, as a country, for the most part, aside from the bigger cities, was fairly underdeveloped in terms of technology and recording equipment. So it was very hard to get some of this music um, to be recorded in a um, really genuine, traditional way. So over time, 
This music developed to what we now know today as narco corridos, um, and even uh, some more modern music, such as corrido tumbados. Um, again, the purpose of this music is to tell a story, but the context is changes over time as to what's going on in Mexico. And during the 80s, 90s, I would say like 70s through the early 2000s, there developed this genre of music called the narco corridos that came from the corridos that was telling stories of drug cartels and the narcos and their groups and what it was like to be a part of the drug cartels, um, what the feelings were surrounding it, specific people in there, and one of the really popular singers that came out of this genre was Charino Sanchez, and a lot of us probably do know him, but he, um, just a little, a little story, some people probably know this story, but he, uh, at his last concert, uh, was singing, and, uh, and this goes to show how, like, involved with the actual cartels the music was and the performers were. He was performing and he received a letter from a, a rivaling cartel that was telling him to stop singing and if he didn't stop singing that he would be killed. And he read, there's like a video of him where he's reading the notes and then he puts it in his pocket and then just continues to sing. And he ended up getting killed, I think it was the next night. Um, and, um, but, yeah, and, and he's not the only one to, uh, um, I I can't remember his name, I think it was Emiliano, I mm, can't remember his last name, but he also was killed by the drug cartel. There's a lot of performers and narco corrido singers that came out of this that um, were really involved with, with drug cartels that got killed because of the culture, but um, I think this is a really good interpretation and recording and song of what corridos kind of sound like today and how it evolved, but also the things that it retained as well. composed in 1907, uh, 1909, sorry, and it's published in 1922. Uh, this uh, is very early on in Manuel Ponce's compositional career. He, at this time, was composing in a very romantic, nationalistic language and style, uh, but he uh, was, at very early on in his compositional career, showed a lot of passion for composing with a Mexican sound, um, using his, that, uh, his native folk influences as like his paints, um, and then the canvas being this romantic style of composing. Um, and I think that this piece, Gretzino Mexicano, is a really good way to show how he implemented the, the aspects, the rhythmic aspects of the son, and using this sort of sesquiapera rhythmic flexibility in the rhythm, while also having the melody be in thirds and having this inflection where at the end of each phrase it sort of goes down and resolves in that way. Um, but he's also still composing like some of his colleagues at his time, like Franz, and like, or I guess that would have been earlier, but um, a lot of those romantic composers during his time. This is Gertino Mexicano. <laughs>
introduction to Manuel Ponce and his music. Um, I do also want to acknowledge that there, there's a lot of call and response in that song, especially, I should have mentioned that before. Um, but he uses a lot of these Mexican uh, aspects of music into uh, his compositions, but that call and response for them is really akin to like any mariachi music that you would hear today. And I think that goes back to this um, uh, genre of the son, where if there was a melody to be sung, it would always have a really heavy and all sort of clear counter melody in the, in the music as well. <clears throat> so Manuel Maria Ponce was born in 1882 in a small town at the time called Fresno Saquetecas. It's much larger now. But early on in his life, his family moved to a city called Aguascalientes. I actually have some pictures here. Here's a, a Fresno Zacatecas now, and like I think that's a picture from the 80s. And then uh, Aguascalientes way back in the early 1900s, which is probably where what it would have looked like when Manuel Ponce was growing up there. Uh, that's where he spent a lot of his childhood. The city offered him a lot more opportunities to be surrounded by music and opportunities for music education. He started to learn how to play the piano at the age of six, and he began to compose at the age of nine. And very early on, he showed a great interest in music and composing and uh, the sort of world of classical music. Um, and he received a lot of opportunities to join ensembles like a church choir at the age of 10. He became the principal organist of that church at the age of 15, which is really, uh, yeah, really young, really young for him to be a principal organist. Um, and at the age of 14, he had his sort of first hit, big hit as a composer. There was a dancer that was named Argentina that was uh, that toured around Mexico and did shows like dance shows. And whether I, I actually couldn't find very much on the dancer and whether or not she was actually from Argentina or whether that was just like a nickname or not. Um, but she uh, danced to one of his pieces that was called Gabot that actually we still play today. Sometimes like you, said, you can find it sometimes on YouTube and like some performers will put it in the programs. Um, but after he was done with high school and like the regular route. Um, that he would take in Mexico uh, for education. He attended the National Conservatory of Mexico City for one year in 1901, and uh, he left because he was dissatisfied with the, due to the quality of instruction. Uh, so he moved back to Aguascalientes and continued to teach and continued to compose and perform his own works and perform the works of other composers. But this wasn't quite enough for him. I think that he probably got left with like a sort of bad taste in his mouth from the conservatory, and he still wanted higher education. So he completely left Mexico for a bit and went on his first big journey to Europe. And he spent a year in Italy and two years in Germany from 1904 to 1907. And he studied musical counterpoint and piano. And it was in Germany where he got encouragement from his classmates to uh, sort of dive into and look into the native folk music of his own roots of Mexico and implement that into his compositions. And he had already been doing that, but he hadn't really, I think, ever uh, really like studied the music of Mexico and the folklore and the origins of it all. And so he, when he returned to Aguascalientes in 1907, um, he began to pursue this in a way. And he ended up going back to Mexico City and teaching at the Conservatory of Mexico City as a professor of piano and music history. And I think that this sort of gave him a, um, excuse me, a, uh, an opportunity to uh, lecture and write and really look into this music and the folklore of Mexico and the origins um, and then spread it around and talk about why it's important. And during this time, he showed a lot of passion for this as well. Uh, he began to compose in really heavily influenced um, uh, Mexican music. Uh, his compositions, he named a lot of his pieces uh, something Mexicano or something Mexicano, like Balada Mexicano, Rapsode Mexicano, or Scherzino Mexicano. Uh, and it was during this time when he composed still in a really romantic, classical style of, of composing, um, just with even more uh, influence from his roots. Uh, I'm going to play a little clip of this. Um, I, do, I do really also want to say that like his music throughout his entire life is, uh, you know, he's not composing folk music, he's composing romantic music, classical music. And a lot of this music is incredibly beautiful and also incredibly virtuosic and difficult to learn and difficult to interpret and, and perform. Uh, but at the same time, he does this uh, in such a beautiful way where he's, he's doing this with classical music while also putting in 
Mexican music into it, and I think that's really special. Uh, there were a lot of different composers at the time that were doing this, like Bella Bartok and Kodai, that were uh, taking a lot of different influences from different uh, folk genres and whatnot, uh, but he uh, did this as well, and I think it's important to note that he did do that. I'm going to play a little piece of this, Balada Mexicana.
that romantic, uh, nationalistic romantic sound that he was really going for during this time in his life. And that was really his, his voice compositionally during this time. So the other person that I mentioned, that I did, didn't mention, uh, that was really influential during his life that he met when he came back during the second trip from Europe and Cuba, he met this uh, classical guitarist by the name of Andres Segovia. And Andres Segovia is the reason why we know Manuel Ponce today in the first place. Um, Man <coughs> Excuse me. Andres Segovia was a classical guitarist, and during the time when he met Manuel Ponce, he was sort of a rising star in the classical guitar scene. And um, he's credited for putting the classical guitar on a, a, uh, a national or international stage. And it's really the reason why we now can study the classical guitar in conservatories and why we can perform it at recitals and why it's really taken seriously as a classical instrument. Um, and so Andres Segovia during this time was performing all throughout different Spanish speaking countries. And so he went to Mexico and had a recital in Mexico City. And that was where he met Manuel Ponce. And shortly after him in uh, Andres Segovia and Manuel Ponce, uh, began to know each other, they began to exchange letters very early on, and Andres Segovia provided uh, not just a musical partnership throughout his entire life, but also a, a really deep and loving friendship with him. And a lot of the early letters that they exchanged are believed to have been destroyed, um, but there's a whole collection of letters from later on in their lives where um, they're sending letters to each other talking about their different compositional ideas and uh, maybe something that Andres Segovia wanted Manuel Ponce to look into compositionally and then Manuel Ponce would send the music to him and say, what do you think about this? And, but additionally, they would talk about their personal lives and at the end of each letter, Andres Segovia always writes, um, hugs and kisses to you and your family, my friend. And a lot of the letters are really personal and um, really wholesome, honestly. And, and there's some that even, there's one letter that I read um, where, Andres Segovia gets really upset with Manuel Ponce for leaving him on red. <laughs> um, but he, I guess he thought that you know, Manuel Ponce wasn't answering any of his letters. And um, he was, I, I guess Andres Segovia thought that maybe he had moved and was like, this is no good, he said, this is no good, you need to send me your new address right away so I can keep in contact with you, I can't lose contact with you, I need to keep talking to you. But um, yeah, he provided, um, a, a international stage for Manuel Ponce and his music, and he was Ponce was sort of his uh, main composer because they were both alive during the same time, and they were both really close friends. Uh, so, yeah, and there's I think these are really cool pictures of them, like really uh, much later in both of their lives, where they're both just being homies, you know. <laughs> so, so after some time, at the age of 40, Manuel Ponce felt very dissatisfied with his compositional technique. So he went on a second trip to Europe, and he uh, lived in Paris for seven years and began to study more music. He began to study with the composer Paul Duca in Paris at the École Normale de Musique. And it was here where he began to sort of come away from this uh, uh, romantic classical sound and found a voice in a more uh, tonally unstable, chromatic, and um, more modern sound, and was, he was really uh, observing a lot of the musical ideas that were in Europe during that time. And uh, it was also here where he composed his first great orchestral, uh, orchestral work of Chapultepec. He had composed piano concertos before, where you know there's a solo piano, and then there's a back, uh, um, there's an accompanying orchestra being played. Uh, but he hadn't really been finding his voice uh, symphonically and orchestrally until this time during his life. So when he returned to Mexico, uh, he began to compose in this more modern style. He began to compose more um, orchestral and symphonic works, but uh, he also still stayed true to his native folk influences, and he still continued to compose even more nationalistically at this point in his life, as he was still a professor and he was still looking into this music, and he began to uh, get a really fiery passion for the music of his native country. Um, so now I'm going to play uh, Cuatro Danzas Mexicanas. This is the first danza. It's a set of four uh, works, four danzas, and they all follow the same form. They follow the form of the Cuban Contra Danza, where the A section is repeated and has a sort of duple meter uh, feel to it. It's usually much faster. And then the B section is slower, more lyrical, and you can hear a lot of the sesquialtera rhythms in it 
where there's a lot of flexibility between tertiary and binary based rhythms, and the, the rhythm is really ambiguous, and um, as well as the harmony. So this is, uh, you'll hear it, and it's a little bit of a different, more modern, uh, classical, contemporary sound, um, but it's, it's still just as nationalistic as all of his music as well. You know what? That's a that's a really good question. I'm 
pretty sure that I wouldn't doubt that he did. He made a lot of music. Uh, so he's really popular for his guitar works. He's also really popular for some of his vocal works as well. Uh, a lot of the popular music from Manuel Ponce that some people already know by him are piano accompanied like opera or vocal pieces um, that are also really, really, really beautiful pieces of music. So I'm almost positive that he probably did love her so much that he wrote her a lot of music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. I, I really appreciate it. And again, I, uh, I think it's important that we all go out of our way to, to acknowledge and learn about this type of music that always gets overlooked. Um, but um, it's also important to know that you know this is growing and still continuing. So thank you.